Hello and welcome to tonight's virtual Inforum program. My name is Ladaris Cordell, retired California Superior Court judge and author of Her Honor, My Life on the Bench, What Works, What's Broken, and How to Change It. Our thanks to the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event and Marcus Books in Oakland for being the club's bookstore partner. It is my pleasure to introduce Shaka Senghor, author of Letters to the Sons of Society, a father's invitation to love, honesty, and freedom. Shaka is a leading voice on criminal justice reform, and his new book is a soulful examination of the bond between fathers and sons. In a collection of letters written to his sons, Jay and Sekou, Shaka traces his own journey as a black man in America and unpacks toxic misconceptions about love, success, mental health, and masculinity. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to ask Shaka your questions. If you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Shaka Senghor, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Your Honor. I'm truly uh, blessed to be here and looking forward to this conversation. So feels good to actually say Your Honor uh, about being in the courtroom. So. I love that. Yes, indeed. Shaka. <laughs> All right, Shaka, you and I have, have something in common, and that's letters. Mm -hmm. I wrote letters to my parents when I was on the bench, and that inspired my memoir, Her Honor. You exchanged letters with your father that inspired letters to the sons of society. So to start off, can you tell us about James C. White, your dad, and how those letters, and I quote from your book, literally saved your life? Yeah, my dad, my dad is really a, a truly my hero in, in the truest sense of he's the person that I look to when I think about fatherhood, when I think about manhood, uh, when I think about what it means to be human. And the reason I say he's my hero because he's an imperfect man. He's not uh, some concocted idea of what we think a hero should be uh, when it comes to like our dads. You know, my dad and I had a very complex relationship. And over the course of my incarceration of 19 years, uh, we exchanged tons of letters. And those letters, when I speak about them saving my life, like my dad's letters really gave me a perspective of life that, you know, helped shape me to be the man that I am today. And my dad's a great writer. He's a great storyteller. Uh, he was very intentional about bringing me into the details of his day and what was going on. Um, and so I still have his letters today in my office, which is uh, pretty, pretty impressive given uh, that those letters span, go all the way back to 1991. Well, can we show some images? We have uh, some photos of your dad. And if we could have those and <laughs> tell us who's in that photo there. So this is my dad and I uh, and my younger sister, Nakia. And clearly my parents did not have any sense of fashion because <laughs> the shoes were terrible. Um, <laughs> but my dad had a cool, cool afro and a great smile. And so, yeah. And where, this, was it, where was this taken? Actually, I'm not sure. It, it, it doesn't look familiar in regards to like one of our homes. So uh -huh. I'm actually not sure where that picture was taken. Okay. And then we have another. Yeah. And this is my dad and I, a couple of years ago, uh, back when I was still home in Detroit. Um, yeah. So I, I'm not sure where we were at. We was probably at, at the house or something. Got it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on and, and talk of, about our, we don't want to show those photos just yet. Okay. I'm going to, Yes. Um, well, let, let me go back just a little bit more about letter writing. Um, I think letter writing has become a lost art uh, mm -hmm. in the age of tweets and, and uh, social media, Instagram. And I think you really nailed it when you wrote in your book. Um, I love this line. Think about receiving a letter. Is there anything better, truly? I think everybody loves getting a letter in the mail, of course, except if it's from the IRS or from the court. Right. But um, I think it's a lost art. And, and I, I'm hoping that your book will help revive, re revive it. Um, you have two sons, Jay and Sekou, to whom you address your letters in the book. So if you could tell us about your sons and when you're telling us, maybe we can show some images of them. Yeah, my oldest son, Jay, is uh, just turned 30 years old last month. And my youngest son, Sekou, just turned 10 years old in December 
Uh, so they're 20 years apart. And my oldest son, Jay, was born six months after I was arrested. Hmm. And so the first time I saw Jay was actually on a visit in the prison room. Um, and my dad brought him up to see me. My dad was really instrumental in sitting him down as a kid and sharing my letters with him and having him write letters. And we kind of built our relationship over telephone calls, you know, visits in prison rooms and letters. And uh, Jay is a dad. He, ha- he also has a son who uh, actually turned 10 this month and he lives in Detroit and works. And, you know, he's still navigating life as a 30 year old. And Sekou lives here with me in LA. Um, he's an incredibly talented, really smart, uh, very precocious, charismatic uh, 10 year old. He's really fascinating and curious about the world. So, you know, the best of my days are spent, you know, parenting and loving on him and figuring out life and, and thinking about the other sons of society that I'm fortunate to intersect with in my work. Wow. So you're, you're a grandfather. What does what your grandson call you? Well, I, actually, I haven't seen my grandson since shortly after he was born. Mm-hmm. His mother and my oldest son, Jade, parted ways and his Got mother uh, moved back to Medico with her family. Got and it. So we haven't had uh, any any contact since that time. I see. Yeah. yeah. So this is um, when Seku was wasn't even one yet. He was just born, and Jay was about twenty something then, I think. Yeah, but I'm okay. about twenty. We have another. We have another image. Yep. And that's Jay and Seku together. Right. Me and Jay. That was when I first came home. Right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And I think we have. Yep. And then that's me and say cool. Maybe a summer or two ago. It's I don't know. It's all, blurring, it's all blurring COVID now. <laughs> yeah. And I think we have one more. And that's. That's my dad and Jay uh, and myself. Um, I can't remember what year. Probably like 1998 or something. Wow. Great. Thank you. I, I find your book so timely because all of a sudden we're seeing all these new TV shows about black boyhood. And there's the Wonder Years starring Alicia Williams. There's Swagger about the early life of NBA star Kevin Durant on Apple TV Plus. Netflix, uh, Colin in Black and White, a limited series from Ava DuVernay. And along with the CW's All American owns David Makes Man, and they all center on the the vulnerability and the emotional complexity of Black boys. And now previously, we saw what we saw were Black boys as comedic relief, right? Steve Urkel from Family Matters, Carlton Banks of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Different Strokes, Webster, that featured orphan Black boys saved by wealthy white folks. So what is all this about now? What do you think is happening? Well, what I hope is happening is that um, Hollywood is starting to ha- hire writers that have lived experience and who really reflect our reality. And that, you know, all the things that's happening in, in the world of social justice and impact is really starting to shift the narrative to, a, to be more expansive, which is what's really important to me. You know, when I sat down and wrote this book, uh, part of it was to counter the narrative that are out there about fathers in general, black fathers specifically, um, and sons in general and black boys specifically because we just haven't had our stories told in ways that really honor our experience. Um, you know, over the years, we've been demonized. We've been written off as, you know, the comedic sidekicks and we're much more complex than that. And I really wanted to speak to that. And I felt like my sons deserve the truth about all of who we are, uh, our less than stellar moments, our moments of excellence and the moments that are really more true to most of us who's just our day-to-day uh, being present in the lives of our children and figuring out uh, how to add to our family's legacy in a meaningful way. And so what we're, ha- what we're seeing now is you're getting more people in the writer room who have broader context. Uh, one of my dear friends is actually in one of the years, uh, Alan Maldonado, uh, he plays the baseball coach. Uh, so it's just great to have content that I can even sit down and watch with my son, uh, Blackish, it was also a great, you know, uh, series that really resonated with me as a dad. Um, and it just created space for honest conversations and it was brilliantly written. So I'm truly excited to see some of the content coming out. Yeah. Uh, but with that being said, 
there's just so much more uh, that needs to be done when it comes to the image of fathers and, and, and their sons. Do you see yourself um, in the writer's room on a TV show about something like Black Boys? Can you see that happening with you? Yeah, well, we're actually in the process of figuring out what that looks like, um, working on wow, the project. Um, and yeah, so I'm really excited about some of the projects we're working on that's inspired uh, by both of my books. So uh, hopefully we'll have something out soon. Fantastic. This is great. I I'm, I'm very happy for you. Uh, th there are there are 19 letters in your book. Five of them you wrote to both of your sons. Uh, the remaining 14 were written either to Jay or to Seku. So how did you decide what letters to write to each son and which to write to them jointly? That's really interesting because I didn't know how many letters. In the book. 19. <laughs> which I think that's, that's actually very symbolic. Wow. I hadn't even thought about that. Oh, that's right. 19 years. Um, yeah. Right? No, I, I honestly have not counted the letters. And wow. I, didn't, I didn't even really think. I just felt my way through writing. Wow. So everything was a feeling with this book. And I think it's one of the reasons that the book is so emotionally vulnerable. Because I didn't really think much about what I was writing. I just felt my way through. Uh, the language and the stories that I thought were really important to tell my sons. And, you know, to think about broadly, um, when, when we're having these conversations as dads, um, you know, I always think of it like this. When I walk in the room and there's young people around, I feel like I'm everybody's dad, you know, because that's the responsibility, I think, that we all hold when we mature to the point of being a parent uh, and or an adult. You know, just that responsibility and, you know, duty of care that we owe to young people so I'm always in like dad mode in, in different ways. And so when I was writing, it was really just from the heart and soul. Wow. Uh, your letters that cover a variety of subjects, including racism, parenting, and isolation. And one is a letter you called Stop Resisting that you wrote to Seku. And, and this is from, from that letter. And I'm just gonna read a short part of it. Black bodies can be murdered threatened with murder or assaulted with impunity. The black body is not considered fully or even partially human. And the key way this is brought home to bear again and again is via two simple words, stop resisting. And then you go on to brilliantly explain to him in this letter that this command, stop resisting, has a meaning far beyond that employed by law enforcement. What did you tell him and what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, you know, everything that I try to express to my sons come from the most human side of who I am and, and who I see them evolving to be. And I think just historically, we have had to have the kind of conversation, uh, especially with the, the, with the public, um, you know, having to reconcile what we've been doing in our communities for decades, um, you know, in it was just important for me to, for him to recognize like how important it is for him to understand his own body, for him to stand up for himself and for, for him to recognize the many ways we resisted. Uh, I've got a mixed feedback from that particular chapter because people are like, well, don't you think that'll cause more trouble? And what I always offer as a response is that, you know, George Floyd didn't resist for nine minutes and he still was carted away in a body bag. And so if the outcome is, you know, my son in a situation where he has to choose his life or, you know, defend himself, I would always want him to defend himself and always do it in a way that's honorable and that stands in, um, you know, in the truth of who he is as a human being, not to be malicious or, you know, uh, vindictive. Uh, he's a beautiful, love-inspired child, very charming and very full of love and laughter. So for him to get to a point where he would have to resist uh, would speak volumes about what was being done to him. And I just think, you know, that cloak that, you know, um, people hide behind when they say stop resistance is just antithetical to what it means to be human. Like our bodies are not designed to be contorted into, uh, you know, manners that aren't, you know, doesn't allow us to be mobile, doesn't allow us to be flexible. And so our natural instinct is to resist because the discomfort is such that your body, you know, um, automatically resists, you know, normally. So, I mean, we always hear stop resisting in the context of policing. And uh, I was uh, an, a police auditor for a bit. And, and I'd sometimes hear this, stop resisting when the person, usually a 
person of color and usually a male was not resisting, but it was used as kind of a pretext to continue to hold someone down. You've, you've used the stop resisting though, outside of the police context as well, right? It's about what we as, you know, as these, these young men uh, and men of color, when you say stop resisting, we mean what? Stop resisting the oppressive society we're in. And if so, how do they stop resisting it? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, I think it really reflects so many of the different things that have been harmful to our communities, right? You know, you think about food, uh, communities that have had food deserts for years up until recently, uh, where there's no healthy food outlets. We think about uh, the ways in which the prison industrial complex has impacted Black bodies. You know, we think about the other areas where we're often just you know, discarded or looked over or not honored in a way that really speaks to who we are as human beings. And part of it is, you know, when you when you grow up in an oppressive environment, you begin to oftentimes submit to that idea that this is your kind of lot in life. And, you know, I really wanted to push back on that. And I think it's really important, you know, for our boys to understand that they have to resist the narratives who tell them that, of, of you know, what they can't be, you know, that you can truly be whatever your imagination uh, allows you to, to conjure up. And I believe that wholeheartedly, like I'm a living example of that. And so we really have to resist those narratives. We really have to resist these systems that don't honor our contributions to the world. You know, when I think of some of the, the young brothers coming up in the, in the world of athletics who are now choosing HBCUs over other colleges that just right. historically have been exploited. Like that's a form of resistance. <laughs> That's a form of saying, look, we're no longer settling for a narrative that doesn't honor us. And, you know, uh, it's time and it's time for the rest of the world to catch up and join us. You know, I think this book, uh, as the title suggests, is an invitation. And if people can lower their guard for just a bit and really step outside of ego, step outside of, you know, fear based narratives, they will find that this book is a wonderful expression of what it truly means to be human uh, at the highest level. Yeah, I, I agree. I absolutely agree. Um, having read the book a couple of times already, and I, I just love, I love it. And I love the way you express these ideas. Um, in your letter, you, there's one called The Freedom to Cry mm. that you wrote to both to Jay and to Sekou. And, and you started with this, and I'm quoting from the book. For so long, young Black men like you have been unable to cry, unwilling to show their sadness, disallowed from the deeper feelings. So whenever you cry, I feel both sad for you as your father and happy for the world. So, so Shaka, how is the shedding of tears handled by black boys and men in America? And, and why should their crying make us happy for the world? Yeah, you know, when I was writing that chapter, I thought about my own journey as, as a boy growing up. And I started to really examine, you know, the emotional disconnect that you know, happened, you know, I was the victim of multiple layers of trauma and also the narrative, you know, tough it, you know, tough it out, suck it up, you know, don't be soft, don't, don't act like a little wimp. And all those narratives that didn't allow, you know, me to, to process naturally and organically things that I was feeling, you know, times when I was afraid, times when I was hurt. And I think it's so important because it speaks to the fullness of all of the human expressions of emotions. Uh, you know, crying is a release for sometimes, sometimes it's a release of joy, sometimes it's a release of sadness, but it's a necessary, uh, you know, release that we all need, you know, especially in these times now where I think people are realizing um, that all of us have gone through something very profound, something very unexpected and something very historic. And, and it's connected us in a way that, you know, nothing else has up to this point. And I think within that, you know, men have found themselves connecting to that part of them that, you know, has got, got erased early in, in, in boyhood. And so I really wanted to make sure that, you know, especially Sekou, since he's the younger, that he really understands the power and the human connection that happens when you're able to emote, whether it's joy, whether it's sadness, uh, and that it actually brings people closer to you as opposed to repel them from you. And it's just a beautiful gift to give to yourself as well as others. Yeah. At one point, you thought that you had lost the ability to cry. And this is again from your book. I didn't cry from 1988 through 2007. 
In fact, I hadn't cried since the night I had attempted suicide at the age of 16. Ever since, I thought I'd lost the ability to cry. I mean, that in and of itself is profound. Uh, so when and how did you regain the ability to cry? What, what changed in your life? Yeah, you know, I, I had this moment um, prior to 2007 where I was watching, um, it, was a, it was one of the anniversary of Roots. And I remember just watching, uh, you know, the, the people who were enslaving our ancestors, uh, you know, capture and beat people. And I just felt like, you know, that, that, that feeling that comes right before crying. And, and, and I didn't get quite get to that point. And that was really alarming to me because I, I, in that moment, I felt like I needed to release all this pent up sadness that I had carried for uh, decades in my life. And when it finally happened, it just came in such an unexpected way. I was on a visit uh, with a friend of mine. I was on a visit in the, in the prison visiting room and she asked me what I hoped for in relation to my freedom. And I began to tell her how much I really wanted to just be a dad more than anything else. And just the thought of what that would mean to me to be uh, connected to my children in a meaningful way and to be able to just wake up and, and talk to them in person and not go years without seeing them. You know, before I knew it, the tears just began to flow. And it was one of the uh, most beautiful experiences that I, I felt, you know, at that point in my life. Uh, there's been many more. Uh, now at this point, I feel like a big crybaby. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's a beautiful gift that I think that specifically men uh, need to reintroduce themselves to. And the reason that I say it's a gift to the world is what, when, when men are aligned with all of their emotions, they become better caretakers, better nurturers, uh, less confrontational less, uh, you know, violent, you know, uh, everything is in a fight because you've had an opportunity to release. And it's just a beautiful gift to the rest of the world when men can stand in, in, in their truth of all of who they are and that they don't have to just wait until they're alone on a car ride or, you know, they're, they're somewhere tucked off. I mean, I've talked to so many grown men who said they've never seen their dad shed tears. And, and that's sad. I mean, at one point that was talked to with so much pride, like, you know, I, ain't, I don't cry because I'm, I'm just so hard that I don't cry. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, most hard things are really brittle and they're really uh, beneficial right. because they lack flexibility or agility. And, and I think it's important if we're going to expand narratives and expand our lives, we have to embrace the fullness of all of our emotions. And this is one of the greatest gifts ever. Uh, that, that I think men can give to themselves. So interesting. Did you ever see your dad cry? Yes, I actually saw my dad cry the first time him and my mother separated. And it's one of the moments that, you know, there's many things that we don't, we don't quite remember from our childhood, but mm -hmm. I have such vivid memories of that moment of my dad. Uh, we were, he and I were in the basement, we were packing up and he was packing up his album collection. You know, he's putting them in old school milk crates, the blue and orange ones. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just remember him like grabbing me, pulling me close to him and assuring me that everything was going to be all right. And he was going to still be my dad. And the tears just started to flow. And so I remember the combination of his beard and his tears on the side of my face. Wow. And it's just a moment I never, I, I, you know, I never forgot. And it's also one of those moments that made me recognize uh, that something was missing in my life because I, felt like I lacked the ability to have that type of emotional expression. Wow. And now you can cry, right? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Mm. Uh, as you, you note in uh, another of your letters, this one you wrote to Jay, and it's called Death Row Sons. Mm. Uh, San Quentin's death row is the largest in the United States, and where 737 men are warehoused, of whom 77% are people of color. Uh, Governor Newsom has recently ordered, uh, issued a moratorium on the death implementation of the death penalty, and he's ordered death row to be dismantled. Okay, so that's happening now. Why did you write to Jay about death row? And what message is it that you wanted to convey to Jay and, and to your readers of the book? Yeah, that particular letter was based on the actual story of me going to death row. You know, I had been to many prisons. Uh, 
once I got released from prison, most people thought I would never go back inside of prison given I had spent 19 years in there. Uh, but, but my work and who I am as a person, you know, I think it's really important to fellowship uh, with people inside prison, especially if you've been inside a prison and you spend time just to be able to model what's possible for people and give them a little bit of glimmer of hope. You know, to me, it's just an honorable thing to do. It feels good. It feeds my soul. You know, whenever I go back on those prison yards, um, while I don't want to go back to prison to serve time, you know, it's special to me to go and fellowship with people who I relate to and who I know uh, relate to me and, and we have a shared experience. And I always just come out feeling so purposeful and so filled with, with just meaning and joy um, because they pour into me and they're proud. I mean, that really matters to me. And so I was on this visit where I, I got invited to uh, go on death row. And it was the first time I didn't know what to say once I walked into that environment. This is San um, Quentin, right? That's at, on San Quentin, yeah. Okay. And prior to going, um, I had met this young man who was driving a uh, Lyft at the time. And we just, he, he just was a, a very positive, upbeat kid. And I just loved his energy. And I was just proud of him. I didn't even know him, but I just felt proud of him, you know, the way he spoke mm -hmm. so passionately about education. And, you know, he was, you know, he had a girlfriend he was engaged to. And, you know, so he was just like a really cool kid. And I was like, man, like, this is beautiful to encounter just such a beautiful human being. And I started talking to him about what was he reading in college. And I told him that I had, you know, I, I had written a book called Right My Wrongs. And we exchanged numbers. And, and when I told him I had written a book, he had got kind of quiet and I didn't quite, you know, understand why until later that evening when he texted me a picture of a man holding a copy of my book, Writing My Wrongs. And initially I thought it was him. And I was like, wow, he looks way older in this picture uh, than, I, uh, than I imagined him to be. But I was like, well, I was sitting in the back seat, so maybe I couldn't see him clearly. Mm -hmm. Um, but he texted me and was like, you know, this, 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 this picture is a picture of my dad. And he's told me about your book and he's reading my, your book in San Quentin and on, and he's on death row. Wow. And it was just so heartbreaking to, to, to know. And so months later, I ended up, you know, going to visit death row and I got a chance to meet his dad. And, and I don't want to spoil the whole story, mm -hmm. but the reason I, I shared it with Jay is because you know, they gave me so much hope of what my relationship in, with Jay could be. And, you know, his father had defied all the odds and obstacles, uh, you know, that, that, that would say that somebody on death row can't be a great father. And this young man, he exalts his father. He loves his father dearly. And he truly respects and honors his father. And I really wanted to share that story with Jay um, because I thought that it would be, you know, something he can relate to. It's it's a fabulous letter. It really is, and and I won't uh, spoil the be a spoiler either. So I want people to to really to read it. Um, let me ask you: Did you have to go through any hoops and any obstacles in getting access to death row? Actually, I didn't, uh, which was hmm. which was uh, uh, shocking. So at the time, I was the executive director of an organization called Anti Recidivism Coalition. And a lot of our work stems from inside prison. So we work with women and men inside prison before they get released. And in that role, you know, I was really fortunate to be able to go inside prisons pretty much anytime I wanted to, you know. So I could go in and our, our team, we have a team called the Hope and Redemption Team, all former, you know, men who served, were serving life sentences. Most of them have served anywhere from, you know, 15 years to 30 plus years. And they are some of the most inspiring human beings I know. Uh, after going through all they went through, they go back and they pour into uh, these women and men on the inside. And so we just have an incredible network of people who do work in that environment. And so I was, at the time as executive director, I was able to go in. And that particular day, we were going to celebrate the opening of a tech lab by an organization called The Last Mile. Um, and so, yeah, we just moseyed on over there and, and they, they yeah, yeah. But it, wow. what I would say to this audience is if you have an opportunity to go inside prisons, I highly encourage you to do it. I think it's so important that county jails in our community and the prisons in our community 
that we actually go and see because it's important for us to know as a society what's really happens in those environment. Uh, but it's also important to understand that over 90% of people will get out of prison one day and we have an opportunity to inspire them, to encourage them, to lift them up uh, and to particularly partic potentially give them resources that will help them uh, come back home and, and add value to society. I think that's terrific. And, you know, my, my view is that everyone is better than the worst things they've ever done in their lives. And it's about having a society that will appreciate that and, and be open to see that people can do better if they're provided the correct environment and um, the proper support. Um, in 2015, you created a movement called Men of Courage. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, so um, there's an incredible man named Sean Wilson. Uh, he and I are good friends. At the time, he was an executive at uh, the Ford Foundation. And we were just talking about, you know, the stories around Black men that just weren't being told. Uh, I had done prior work with, a, with another incredible organization called Be Me Community. At the time, that was known as Black Male Engagement. And when Sean and I met, we knew that we wanted to do, create something that, that put men in rooms and allow them to create vision boards and action boards and tell stories to enrich each other's lives and network with each other. And we sat at each other's dining room table. You know, one day it was my dining room table and we put together a vision board. Um, you know, I would go to his home, he would cook a dinner and we would just sit there and, you know, have food and drinks and, and imagine a world where the truth was told about us. Um, and so we created this, this organization called Men of Courage uh, which is still being, you know, ran by Ford, uh, Ford Foundation. Uh, Sean Wilson has moved on to do other work with the Boys and Girls Club of America. And, you know, I've moved on to do other work as well. But we still support that, that I still support that foundation. And I'm often doing work with uh, the Men of Courage in, in different cities. And we've also been, you know, a part of uh, an, a traveling exhibit called Men of Change, which is, just left LA recently, and I think it's headed to Baltimore, um, or it actually may be in Baltimore right now. But it's just incredible work that's, that's really about telling the truth about our stories. So where is Men of Courage based? So the home base is in Detroit. Um, the the uh, Justin, who currently runs it, lives in Detroit, and, and uh, this woman named Pamela, uh, who's an executive at Ford, they run it out of, but it's in multiple cities. And, and you, you mentioned about the exhibit going around, but is it an organization that provides classes, is it support groups? What exactly happens? So the exhibit is uh, housed in museums and communities. And then out of that uh, exhibit, there's a few things that tend to take place. These activations that uh, Men of Courage is doing at different barbershops called the Barbershop Challenge. And it challenges barbershops and communities to uh, do social impact work. And in turn, they end up getting funded for some of that work, but they also get their barbershops redesigned. Mm -hmm. It's really just a great, you know, very community, community oriented work, but the exhibit itself is, uh, laid out by Smithsonian. And so it, it, it oh. tends to, uh, exist inside of museums. Got it. Fantastic. But it's so great. It's, it's, it's really great. And it's, it's typically free. So that's good as well. That's great. I hope the exhibit eventually gets to the Bay area. Um, I think it would be terrific. Um, yeah, I got to talk to Justin about that. We, we actually did it down here in L.A. Yeah. Great. I was able to take my dad. Uh, I flew my dad out to, to spend some time with me in L.A. And I was able to take him and my stepmom or my bonus mom uh, <laughs> to go to the exhibit. And it's really one of the most powerful days of my life. Wow. So, Shaka, let, let's talk parenting, uh, a subject that you wrote about in a letter to Sekou. And in it, you described your own upbringing, writing, and I quote, the end of our family as I'd known it came in 1983. I was 11 years old. What happened? Yeah, my dad and mom, mom separated for the first time. And then they did that kind of dance for a few years where they separated, got back together, separated. Uh, but nothing was ever the same, you know, and the, the, the safety blanket and security of, you know, just having an intact family. Uh, was very different. My mother, you know, showed up in different in our lives. And, you know, my dad, he did the best he could, you know, but it was very complex, you know, and, and it's one of the things that I, 
I think we don't talk enough about is the impact that divorces have on children, especially when we're not honest about what happened. Like we were blindsided by their separation um, and, and the impact of, of when parents aren't aligned in terms of how to parent. And, you know, people have different agendas and things of that nature. So I really wanted to talk to Sekou about that specifically because his mom and I, you know, we separated when he was about two and a half, three years old, but we decided to really go on this journey as co-parents and to be really present and center him in, in true love and, and, and center our raising of him in love and, and, and love and respect of each other. You know, it's not always easy. Uh, we're, we're not always amazing at it, but we're always <laughs> intentional and very conscious of what our responsibilities are. You know, and I read that in your book, uh, I, I had some some flashbacks to when I was on the bench. Uh, I presided over hundreds of cases in family court where parents just fought mightily over custody of their children. And, and the stress on everyone, especially the children, was just awful. And I, I quickly learned you cannot mandate harmony. Um, yeah. it's, it's just mission impossible, right, to get warring parents to resolve custody issues in, a, in an amicable way. Um, as you noted, you and Sekou's mother harmoniously co-parent him. And there's a, there's a line in the book I, I, I want to read to you. It is, um, co-parenting is not only a choice that honors what's best for us. It's a choice that honors the best of who we are as parents. So I, I want you to talk a little bit more about the co-parenting. And if you could also include in that your nightly ritual with your son, Sekou. Yeah, the co-parenting, you know, it, it, it's, as, as all parenting, it's trial and error, right? Um, you know, it's, it's figuring out what works, figuring out what's different, figuring out, you know, really what, what Sekou's needs are and detaching our ego from it. You know, I, I try to do what's called egoless parenting. Like, like Sekou has his own life, but it's his to own. And, you know, I, I'm only responsible for it really for a short amount of time. Uh, but ultimately, his life is his own. And, and I think that children come to the world equipped with all the things that they need. Uh, they, they come to the world as, as fully human beings, you know. Um, and so they just need a little bit of structure around, around them, a little bit of protection. But for the most part, I think, you know, removing ego from how we've chosen a parent has been really helpful. And it, re it, re it requires us to think more broadly about what it even means to be a parent and not just hey, here's, it's your day, it's your custodial day, or, you know, he needs these shoes or whatever. It's also recognizing that as a mom, she needs a break sometime and that she needs to just be able to be without anything attached to a break because she has a job or she has any other thing. But no, sometimes you just need a break from your, your children uh, and being intentional about honoring that and, and, and calling that out and, you know, making sure we, we're, we're intentional about communicating about things that impact his life. And so, you know, we communicate as much as possible. Um, we agree on probably like maybe 85% of things. Uh, and the 15% we don't agree on, they're not like tough knockdown drag out disagreements, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really just sitting around the love of our son and wanting him to have a healthy experience and a healthy relationship with both of his parents. And I think it's, you know, what we what we've been able to do for the most part is to honor who we are as parents, even when who we were as lovers didn't work out. Got it. And what about the nightly ritual? Yeah, so every night, you know, we have a nightly ritual. His mom, you know, their ritual is doing prayer together. And my ritual with Sekou is doing affirmations. And, you know, we've been doing that basically since he's been a, a, a baby. Um, and it's the best, like he gets excited. He loves his affirmations. He loves to know that, you know, he, you know, we believe in him and that we know that he's magic and he's thoughtful and he's kind and he's loving. Um, and it's just the best, you know, to, to, to even hear him mirror those things back when he's going through something he's able to access and like, oh, I'm smart, I can figure this out, um, you know, and, and or I'm funny and I, you know, I can make people laugh and it helps me make friends and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I just think it's important for children, you know, to be affirmed by their parents. They look to us as their first kind of narrative creator. You know, we create the narrative that they eventually embrace. And, and so I think it's just important 
and especially for dads to affirm their sons. I can't even tell you how many um, stories of, of dads I've heard who withhold just saying the words that son, I'm proud of you um, from their sons for, for, for like decades, you know, it's almost today on their like dying deathbed. They're like, Oh, by the way, I, I'm proud of you, you know, 40, 50 years later. And I just think it's such a tragic loss. I think it's really self, I think it's selfish as well. Uh, I think we just call that, that what it is. I just think mm -hmm. it's selfish. Um, but I think it's a great loss, not only for the child, but for the dad, because I see what happens when I say to say, cool, man, I'm really proud of you and how that just fires him up and, and, and charges him up to do even more. So, you know, I, I would just say to any parent, give yourself the gift of affirmations and recognize when you're affirming them, you're actually affirming yourself. That's fantastic. Is your book of value to white parents of white sons? I mean, would your advice to them be any different? In advice you offer in your book? I honestly think that, that this book is probably the greatest gift white parents will ever get. Why is that? Because I think it's, it's just very honest and it gets through a lot of the social rhetoric. It cuts through a lot of the, um, you know, the things that, that creates the vision as opposed to creating proximity. And, and I think that what it does is it really lays out the things that we've struggled with culturally in a way that comes from the heart and soul. And it doesn't come from like a sense of anger. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I have friends of, of every nationality, you know, possible. I feel like, I, you know, I got friends who are Japanese and Chinese and, you know, I, I just have friends all over the place. And we're talking about the same things. We have the same moments with our children. We have similar dreams and aspirations. And I think that the nuance that is articulated in this book is something that really will help white parents understand this greater responsibility that they have when it comes to raising their children in a multicultural world. Um, and, and the greater sensitivity that's required when people are telling them what has hurt them and what's been harmful. Um, you know, it, it's really sad that we, we live in a society where just the idea that I, I can say that, you know, I had a racial incident that impacted me and instead of just holding space and listening, that they're either trying to deny or minimize or shrink. And I think this book really will help them understand the nuanced nature of it and how powerful, you know, and how massively impactful uh, racism has been on the lives of people of color. Love it. Um we're gotta, I'm going to just kind of uh, include some questions from the audience, but one of the uh, questions that's come in and uh, concerns your first book, a New York Times bestseller, Writing My Wrongs. So I'm going to ask my question first, and then I'll follow it up with the question from the person, from, from the audience. So um, in, in a letter to Jay called Freedom is My Legacy, mm -hmm. you describe the very first sale of your first book, Writing My Wrongs, that became a New York Times bestseller. And so I, I read that in your book, and that reading that brought to mind a recent interaction that I had. I was in my car and I was preparing to leave a parking lot, a grocery outlet here in Palo Alto, when in the car parked next to me was a brother who was sitting in the passenger seat and parked next to mine. So he rolls down his window. Turns out he'd been in my court. This is what he told me more than like 30 years ago. And he told me he appreciated how I'd handled his drunk driving case. And I'd given him time served when the prosecutor wanted him to have more time. So then he says, he asked me if he could buy a copy of my book right then. So, yeah. so I told him, I said, well, I don't have, I don't have any books in my car. And, he, and this brother looks at me and he says, judge, you should sell them out your trunk. That's what you should be doing. Sell them out your trunk. Right. So I chuckled and I thought, I said, it's an option, but you know, I thought about it. Um, Shaka after and reading your book, it's like, that's really black economics, Absolutely. right? Yeah. You know, throughout the country. So talk to us, you went from selling your book, this first book from the trunk of your car to it landing on the New York Times bestseller list. And, yeah. and in this book, uh, Letters to the Sons, you describe how you pulled off this amazing feat and you were like this entrepreneur on steroids. So can you give us just a quick summary? How did you do that? Yeah, so when you know when I was incarcerated and I began to try to try to think of life beyond prison, you know, I started writing and I actually published my first book from prison in 2008. Then I got sued by the prison because they thought I got a publishing deal and they wanted to take my money. And I was able to navigate that. But as soon as I came home, I started selling books. 
Uh, you know, I, I came up in the streets hustling, but also love hip hop. And I saw what some of the rappers had did with their mixtapes. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I just grew up in, the, you know, Detroit, where I come from, it's a hustler city. Like, you know, people are selling dinners. They're, you know, throwing house parties. Just, you know, that's what my parents grew up doing. They, they sold dinners and, and, and did parties. And a lot of times in our community, we don't always have access to get to a bookstore. Uh, they're typically out in the suburbs. Um, and so I was like, let me bring the books to the people. So I just started hustling books at the parks, uh, at the gentlemen clubs, at the, you know, Jehovah Witness coming to my dorm selling books. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I was hustling those books. But I actually started off writing fiction. And, and then I just realized, you know, I had to think differently about it. So I made a little minor adjustment and I started focusing more on speaking, uh, my speaking career because when I went and spoke, I sold more books. And it was during one of those events that I was speaking that a woman in the audience, she got the book and she ended up, um, excuse me one second. Sure. Um, she got the book and she ended up taking that book to Oprah. And Oprah, oh, uh, yeah, Oprah initially, wow. yeah, she initially was like, why would I read this book? The cover was way different than the one that's on the shelf right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but she was like, this guy looks tough and mean. And why would, I, why would I read this book? But she was getting ready to move her company out to L.A. And she decided to take the book with her. And she got about 50 pages in. And she was like, I want to interview this guy. And so wow. um, one of the trivia facts is that if people go and watch the interview with Oprah and I, the book that she's actually quoting from is not the one that's on the shelves. It's the one that I was hustling out of the trunk. So it's one of my prouder moments of life. But I also wrote it down in my journal that, you know, I wanted, I wanted Oprah to read one of my books and it eventually happened. And you know, then we went on to become friends. And, um, but yeah, that, that, that hustle comes from, you know, just watching other entrepreneurs and figuring out how to, how to scale it up a little bit, but you know, book industry is a tough industry to, get yeah. books. So we need everybody on the thing to go buy our books right now. And Absolutely. And help us keep Absolutely. Writing. And you just mentioned real quickly that you keep a journal. Do mm -hmm. you, do you, do you, and tell us why. Yeah. So when I, when I was in, in solitary confinement, I really wanted to understand how I had went from, you know, dreaming of being a doctor uh, to serving out my most promising years in prison. And I had been reading uh, some philosophy, Socrates, uh, apology, when he talked about the unexamined life not being worth living. And so I decided to examine my life through journaling. And that's, you know, I started journaling back then. I don't do it as much now, probably because I just post what I write, what I think on social media or in my notes and my phone. Um, but it's all a form of journalism, just getting those thoughts out. Well, uh, this is the question from someone in our audience. I loved your first book and mm -hmm. can't wait to read this one. How was the writing process for this book different from writing my wrongs? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, th I think one, I just think I'm a different writer at this stage of my life. You know, I've had an opportunity to experience, you know, uh, life on this side of the fence. You know, I wrote Writing My Wrongs shortly after I got out of prison, so I hadn't been home that long. Uh, so my experiences was limited. And this one was a little more like, I'm, I'm like a grown man now. You know, I felt like when I came home, I thought I was grown, but I still had some arrested development. But you know, I've been through a few relationships which grow you up relatively quickly and, you know, a few job changes and traveling across the country, outside of the country. So I've just matured as a writer. And I think from a process standpoint, um, I, I use technology now. Like I just write notes on my phone and because it was letters, you know, I just have all these moments when I'm inspired by something related to my son. And so I would just jot down notes and then I just take those notes and transfer them and old school style with a modern old school and write them in, you know, a word document or a, a pages document. Um, but it was, it was very, very different. You know, I miss kind of writing longhand. I, I don't know if I'm, I, I, don't, I, I just don't feel like I have that type of time. So I got to maybe make that time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a different process. Well, wow. here's a question. Another question from our audience Incarcerated people were largely an afterthought with pandemic protections. How have advocacy groups had to step up to protect them where the government has failed? Yeah, that's a great question. So when the pandemic first hit, the first people I thought of outside of uh, my immediate family was, you know, 
the women and men who are incarcerated. And, you know, I was like, we got to do something. We got to help people. We got to make sure that they got PPE. And I was really fortunate to have some friends who stepped up. Um, I had some friends stepped up who helped me donate 100,000 masks to Rikers Island wow. uh, prison in, uh, uh, in Memphis and, and one in uh, uh, Mississippi. And that created kind of like a chain of events. So at the time, I, I partnered with uh, Reform Alliance, which was uh, founded by Van Jones and um, uh, Jay-Z and, and the rapper Meek Mills. And so we partnered with Jessica Jackson. Uh, we partnered on that, got those delivered. And then that inspired like Madonna to donate uh, some. And then uh, Jack Dorsey from tw uh, Twitter ended up donating about $10 million for more PPE. And I, and I just think that's the reality of the world. We live in the private sector has to step in where the government fails. And, you know, that was, that was really important. Uh, it's not known by many that I kind of initiated that, that, that wow. action, but, you know, it's something I'm really proud of because my friends were incarcerated and I, and I wanted to make sure they were as safe as possible given the circumstance. You know, Shaka, in that last answer, you dropped a whole lot of names. That's just amazing. <laughs> just amazing. Um, yeah. What has been your son's reaction to the book? Uh, say Coos or Jay's? Or uh, both. both. And I'd like to know, you know, did their reactions match your expectations? <laughs> yeah, Jay, Jay hasn't been interested in reading it, and I kind of expected that. And I'm, I was fine with that. It's, it, you know, and whenever he's ready for it, it'll be there. Uh, but say, say Coos, uh reaction exceeded my expectations. How so? Um, he just got so hyped up and like, you know, I was thinking about the, the introduction, right? So I'm writing about these sneakers, you know, I'm a big sneaker fan of right. sneakers. Right. And, you know, for him to be able to understand contextually what was happening between the sneakers I won and the sneakers that my dad got me, he just had such a big laugh and like, I'm like, do you even know what these sneakers are? So he got it, like just on a, on a, <laughs> right. on a, on a humor level, you know, and so it's been great, but he's so proud. You know, he's really, really proud. And, you know, it, it's, it's the best feeling in the world to have, you know, your child proud of you and, and, and in a real way, you know, so it's been great. Absolutely. And I remember the section uh, in one of the letters about the sneakers was great. Um, <laughs> another question from the audience. Do you think the First Step Act from 2018 will be successful? Reform advocates like Van Jones got some heat for working with then President Trump to get it passed. Yeah, you know, I, so here's my here's my honest perspective. Um, I don't personally care about politics. I care about people, and whoever is willing to help get people out is the only thing that matter. What was interesting is that Van caught a lot of heat for working with the Trump administration, um, but. We didn't catch a lot of heat when the Clinton administration helped massively incarcerate people. Uh, and so, you know, if we're gonna be honest, we just have to be honest on both fronts. And, you know, I, I think the First Step Act is just what the title said, it was a first step. It was one step of many that need to be taken. You know, we didn't get here overnight. One administration isn't gonna fix it. Uh, in fact, you know, I'm not even confident that you know, each administration moving forward won't undo some of the things that was done. And so this is a protracted struggle to get people out of prison and to end the incentivizing of, you know, private prisons and people who benefit from it. So we've got tons of work to do. Uh, I stand by Van's decision to shepherd that work forward. You know, he has a, um, you know, he has a resume of, 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 you know, actively organizing people that spans over 30 decades. And so Van wow. will be doing, you know, organizing, you know, far beyond Trump's, you know, or any other president's uh, reign. Uh, so I stand behind it and, I'm, and, and he stands behind it. And, you know, one of the things that, that happens when you do good is you get a ton of heat, no matter what. No, you can't satisfy everybody. And if you hope to satisfy everybody when you're trying to do meaningful work, you might as well stop before you get started because it's just not going to happen. I hear you. Uh, but I mean, I, I just want to ask you, do you really mean this, that you don't care about politics? I mean, isn't everything political that we're trying to do in terms of making all of these systems better? Well, what I mean by I don't care about politics, I mean, I don't care about the people who are in political office. Like, I don't trust them to be 
that much different from each other. They're not, they're not vastly different. Uh, it just depends on who's the most charismatic in, in delivering a message. Um, and and I, I think bipartisan is more realistic for most people, even though we probably won't admit it. But it's not something that I focus like. I don't wake up and watch CNN or Fox or whatever and see what little dust stuff is happening with politicians. I'd rather mm-hmm. spend that time in community. I'd rather spend that time with people. Uh, I vote when necessary. Um, and, and I just keep it moving. I just don't I spend a lot of energy on mm-hmm. getting riled up because a politician says something that I didn't like or, you know, that, that's just not that important to me. Like the, the personalities of politicians isn't that important to me. It's more about are they doing the job that we need them to do, that they're being paid mm-hmm. to do. Um, and we can def- we definitely have a responsibility to hold their feet to the fire when they're not. But I just, I, you know, I, I got, I'm 50 years old, so I'm like, I got to have some joy and that space does not bring joy. So I just have to keep it moving. So does that mean that if someone approached you, um, could be Oprah and said, I think you should run for office for some office, would you ever do that? No. Never? Yeah, no, nah, no, no interest in politics. Like I've done all my hard work. I'm like, I'm, I want to <laughs> do, I want to do creative stuff. I want to do fun stuff. I want to do technology-based stuff. I have no interest in in running for any political office. Because oh. I, I believe you could get elected to whatever it is you run for. But okay, <laughs> so another question from the audience. We're almost two years from the murder of George Floyd. How do you feel that society's view of black men has changed? Are we backsliding after the promises of change that were made immediately after his murder? I mean, when we're talking about the narrative around black men, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, centuries of, of, of problematic behavior. We're talking about 400 years since the first slave ships left the continent of Africa and trying to undo that narrative in two years is just not possible. And there's always going to be some steps forward, some steps backward. Um, you know, and I think it really comes again down to the people. You know, I think what happened with, with George Floyd, honestly, and, and I'm rarely pessimistic, honestly, you know, when it comes to mm-hmm. people. But I think the perfect storm had to happen in order for people not to just slink back into their day-to-day lives. If we were not in a global pandemic, I do not think we would have had the type of conversations we're currently having uh, at the, the magnitude and the depth in which we're having them. Because what happened is the, is the global pandemic kind of forced us to really pay attention to what was happening in the world because we were stagnant. We weren't in our offices. We didn't have the cozy comfort of seeing something on the news, turning it off and going to our local bar and acting like it didn't happen. And so I just think that perfect storm lined up in that way. Uh, but we got tons of work to do. You can't, you can't mm-hmm. undo what has happened historically um, in, you know, in two years. And I, I know that's, that's, right. that's America really think there's a quick fix. They think we live in a post-racial society. You know, I'm just like, what that represents to me more than anything is, is our country has a culture of laziness when it comes to intellectual discourse. And we are grossly uh, inept at getting to the truth and being honest with each other. And so uh, I think we got a lot of, a long way to go. The fact that we're in there fighting about critical race theory in classrooms and banned books at this junction in society where pretty much you can have everything, you know, access to everything online really speaks volumes about how backwards we are and how far we got to go. It is scary. It is absolutely scary. Uh, uh, back to the book for a second. You, you have a problem. Uh, I found this interesting. You have a problem with Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken. Yeah. What is your issue with it? I mean, I, I just think it sets up an either or proposition. And that just hasn't been how a lot of us have had to navigate our lives. You know, we've had the chart our own course, we've had to figure it out. We've, we've had to walk in places where there were no roads, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. We've had to swim across troubled waters. We've had to, you know, take back alley routes and, and, and really chart a new pathway. And when I think about it, you know, when I, when I walked out of prison, there was kind of two pathways for me, get a regular job mm-hmm. or get back to the streets. Nobody ever considered that I had a dream or that I was even worthy of, of dreaming. And so yeah. I just don't like the idea that there's you know, only the, the road less traveled or the one that's well worn, uh, when in reality, you got to chart your own course and you, and you can do that. And so while it was, you know, romantically and poetically a beautiful sentiment, I just think it, it, it sets up a, a, 
either or proposition. And that's just not realistic in life. It's really interesting. After I read that in, one of, uh, in the book, I, I read the poem again and thought, well, my goodness, I, I just never had that take on it. And uh, I think it's, again, I just think it's brilliant the way you look at the world and look at people. Um, another question from the audience, is there a letter or a story that didn't make it into the book that you wish did? <laughs> yes, there's tons of those. <laughs> Can you give us uh, examples, a few? I think that there, there's a story, um, and I mean, it kind of came late in the writing of the book, but I was mm -hmm. I was able to be featured on this, this song with Nas um, wow. uh, on his new album. It's a Grammy-nominated album now. And the story of how that happened and, and the reason why it means so much to me, uh, mm -hmm. that one didn't make the book but it, it'll, it'll make the next, next it'll one. be in your next book. Right. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And any others that come to come to mind that you wish uh, you had? I, 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 you know, there's letters. I think I, I'm, it's kind of hard uh, when I think about relationships and there's just so much I want to share with my sons about relationships and what my experiences was with the different relationships I've been in uh, lessons I've learned. Um, yeah, so I, I, that one has been a little more complex because I'm, you know, I'm really oh. sensitive to, you know, the women that I've dated, the women that I've been in relationships, even when things didn't go right. Like I, I would never want to do, like harm, right. and sometimes it's hard to not do harm if you want to tell the truth. And so I haven't yeah. thought about how to how to navigate the complexities of dating, post incarceration, mm -hmm. and post success. Those are just yeah. Oh. A lot. There's a lot. A lot more to come from Shaka Senkor. So Shaka, we have been in conversation for an hour and I've loved every minute of it. I, I love the questions that have come in from those who are in our audience. So um, we're going to wrap it up at this time. And it is a tradition within forum to ask our speakers the, the following question. So I'm going to ask this of you. This is our last question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? My 60 second idea is to hug our boys. That's it. Just have a hug a thon with our boys. Um, and, and really, I would love for dads to lead that hug a thon. I love it. Our thanks to Shaka Sankor, author of Letters to the Sons of Society A Father's Invitation to Love, Honesty, and Freedom. We encourage all of you to purchase a copy of Shaka's book at your local bookstore. And we are, Marcus Books in Oakland is a partner with the Commonwealth Club. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash events. I'm Ladaris Cordell. Thank you, stay safe and take care. Thank you so much for being a great moderator. Oh, you're fantastic. I loved every minute. <laughs>